In all the hurry and hustle and confusion of modern living, the Lord has a way. We believe that the Bible is God's revelation of His way. We invite you to join us for In Search of the Lord's Way with Mac Lyon. Greetings to you, my friend, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's great to have you join us today. Every growing number of people just like you in search of the Lord's way to live here in this world and to make preparation for heaven. One of the most exciting and meaningful chapters in American history was written in the summer of 1787. Representatives met in Philadelphia to write the Constitution of the United States of America. George Washington was presiding. And after they had struggled for several weeks and had made, well, very little progress, 81-year-old Benjamin Franklin rose to his feet and he addressed the trouble and disagreeing convention that was about to adjourn in confusion. In the beginning of the contest with Britain, he said, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayers in this room for divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard and they were graciously answered. All of us who were engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instances of a superintending providence in our favor. Have we now forgotten this powerful friend, or do we imagine we no longer need his assistance? I've lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of man. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We've been assured, sir, in the sacred writings that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this, he said. I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth prayers employing the assistance of heaven and its blessings on our deliberation be held in this assembly every morning. What a powerful statement by a great statesman concerning the providence of God. And that's the title of our program today, The Providence of God. After Ken Heltbrand leads us in a hymn of praise to him, I'll be back to read the passage which Mr. Franklin referred to a moment ago. Our scripture reading is going to be in Matthew chapter 10, beginning at verse 27. Jesus is here now chosen His twelve apostles, and He's sending them out on what's sometimes called the limited commission. And here's what He says, among other things, What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what you hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which uh, uh, will kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Whosoever, therefore, shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. And I read through verse 33. Now with the, the Lord's words in our mind, let's go to Him in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, 
We're thankful to you for this passage and many others and the demonstrations in our lives of your divine providence and your care and your concern for us in all of our needs and in every day of our lives. Thank you, Father, for this assurance, for these blessings. And as we meditate on them, we pray your presence with us and your blessings upon us. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. present circumstances, the statement of faith I read from Benjamin Franklin a while ago about the providence of God is especially meaningful. Those who would rewrite the history of America, omitting all references to God and religious faith and the founding and the development of this great country, are not being honest, and they do our generation and the next generation and the next a disturbing disservice. What an inspiration! that our nation was born in a convention of men, many of whom believe strongly in the providence of God. Indeed, it's true. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, just as the Bible says. Well, we do well to remember that these two centuries after the founding of our nation. I too believe that God supervises and controls the events of our lives and the events of our nation and of the world. I believe that God causes these events to result in the accomplishment of His divine will some way or other. We may not be able to see it at that time. It's as Elton Trueblood says, there doesn't seem to be much reason for worshiping a God who has made a world such that He is effectually shut out from all participation in its management. The harmonious way in which the universe is made is evidence of God's great love and concern for man. Such ordinary things as the air we breathe, and the water we drink, and the beauty of the color of the earth, and full color, and even life itself, are evidences that God cares about us, and He provides even our most common or ordinary needs. Paul preached to the philosophers of Athens that God gives to all life and breath and all things. Verse 25 of Acts chapter 17. You see, God created the world completely. Then He created man and put man into the world that He had made. If human fathers are concerned about their offspring, surely it shouldn't be too hard for them to believe that the Heavenly Father cares for His offspring too, as in Acts chapter 17 verse 28. Don't you think that's reasonable? The providence of God is often related to the subject of prayer, and it should be. All through the New Testament, Christians are admonished and encouraged to pray. There are passages like 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, in which Paul says, Pray without ceasing. Another is Hebrews 4, verse 16, where the Holy Spirit says, Draw near with boldness to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. 
One of my favorite passages is Matthew 7, verses 7 to 11. It's a segment of our Lord's great Sermon on the Mount. He says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asks receives, and he that seeks finds, and to him that knocks it shall be opened. Then he draws some analogy, the same analogy that I did a while ago. He says, What man of you is there whom if his son asks bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask Him? Well, aren't these passages convincing statements of God's willingness and His power to provide our needs? Obviously, not everything we ask for in prayer will be given us in just the way that we ask it. Sometimes we ask Him for things that aren't good for us things that in some circumstances could be harmful or perhaps even totally destructive to us. A child, for example, might ask his father for too much candy, or an adult may pray the Heavenly Father for too much money. Just as the child's father would be wise in refusing the child too much candy, the Heavenly Father is wise in not giving us everything we ask for. In James chapter 4 and verse 3, the Holy Spirit says that sometimes you ask and receive not because you ask amiss. It's been said, in answer to man's prayer, God sometimes says yes, sometimes no, and sometimes He says, wait a while. It all isn't always possible uh, to prove with absolute certainty that a specific event in our lives is an act of providence. We can't prove it, though we believe it is, because God has promised that He does and that He will care for us. And as an example, we might think of the man who uh, may hurry to the airport to catch an airplane to some distant city. Or oh, the traffic is heavy and he's delayed in traffic, and he arrives at the boarding gate about two minutes after the plane has departed. Oh dear. Now he's missed the flight, and he'll miss that important meeting that he had scheduled with somewhere, somebody, and he may lose that contract. Oh, later he learns that that plane crashed, and everyone aboard was killed. Is this an act of providence that caused him to miss that flight, that saved his life? Who knows? God's providence isn't, providence isn't always visible while it's happening. It's only in retrospect that we look backward on it that we're able to see it as such. The story of Joseph, oh, way back in the book of Genesis, chapters 32 to 50, is a good example of such providence, and it's the one of the best that I know of anywhere. Joseph, as you know, if you're a Bible student, was one of the 12 sons of Jacob, his favorite son, as a matter of fact. And this was part of the problem. His father favored him too much, which caused the others to be jealous of him. They sold him as a slave. Now you think of that a moment. What a terrible experience. Your own brothers sell you as a slave. They even go back home and show Jacob, their father, Joseph's blood-stained coat, stained with the blood of an animal. And they tell a lie to their father. They tell him that Joseph is dead. He's been slain by a wild beast. Well, Joseph has been taken into captive in Egypt. Don't you know Joseph must have been thinking, if there is a God, why doesn't he do something about this dishonesty and hypocrisy and deception and injustice? In Egypt, Joseph was bought by a man whose name was Potiphar, a captain of the guard and a favored man by the Pharaoh or the king. Potiphar brought Joseph into his house as a servant, and he put everything he had in Joseph's hand. He was favored in this man's sight. Things were going well until Potiphar's wife one day cast her eyes upon Joseph, the Bible says, and attempted a sexual encounter with him. 
But Joseph was a man of integrity, and he resisted the temptation of her advances. And he said, How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Well, you know the rest of the story, don't you? Potiphar's wife, offended by Joseph's rejection, convinced her husband that Joseph had attempted to rape her. And Joseph went to prison for a deed that he had not done. Don't you know that Joseph must have thought over and over while he was there in that prison cell, God, where are you? Why don't you hear my prayers? Why do you permit such injustice to happen? In prison, Joseph interpreted some dreams for some people and one of whom promised to remember Joseph to Pharaoh uh, when he was released. But he didn't. And Joseph was held captive on and on. While in prison, Joseph must have thought many, many times, God, if you really do care, and if you can really do something about such injustices and inequities as these that I'm suffering here in this very real-life situation, why don't you get me out of here now? But in all of this, the Bible just keeps saying over and over that God was with Joseph. But the Lord was with Joseph. Over and over again, it says it. But I'm sure Joseph couldn't see it. Where was he if he was with him? Well, eventually it happened. Joseph came to be what would we would call today the Prime Minister of Egypt. Pharaoh wore the robes, and Joseph was the man. Then, after some years, a great famine spread all across the world, and it was especially bad in Canaan, where Jacob and the brothers of Joseph lived. But because of Joseph's doings, there was plenty of food in Egypt. Jacob sent his sons to Egypt to buy food, and bring it back to them in Canaan. And from whom must they buy the food? That's right. You have it right. They had to buy the food from Joseph, their brother, whom they had sold into slavery. Now, the shoe's on the other foot, as we sometimes say. Those brothers feared for their lives. But Joseph was a just man, and and he had them and their father and all of their relatives brought down into Egypt where he could look after them and see them through the days of this famine. Jacob died. Their father died. After the burial and the mourning was all over, the evil brothers said, Oh, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and gets even with us now? He's the man in power. Remember all the wrongs we did to him. So they fabricated another lie. They sent word to Joseph and said, Now, Father left these instructions before he died. They said, This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. It wasn't so. He didn't say anything like that. And Joseph knew that. But Joseph was a good man, a man of integrity. And when he heard it, he said to them, Don't be afraid. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And he spoke kindly to them. God permitted all of that jealousy and all of that deceit and all of that hypocrisy and lying to happen to Joseph. But he used it for good to bring about his will for his people. By all of that, he preserved the family of Israel and the lineage of the Messiah, just as he had promised to Abraham and Isaac and to Jacob. That reminds me of a favorite passage from the New Testament. It's a favorite with lots of people. It's Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and it says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to His purpose. 
Now the verse doesn't say that when you become a child of God, everything that happened to you is going to turn out good. No. No, God doesn't promise that. You hear that preached from time to time, but, but that isn't what the Bible says. It does say that out of all of the evil that's done to you or comes to you, God will turn it into good if you love Him and if you're called according to His purpose. There are lots of people who could relate experiences very similar to those of Joseph. When people they've loved and trusted and respected have through envy and jealousy and deceit lied about them, tried to destroy them in every way possible, if not physically, they tried to destroy their good name or, or hinder the good work they were doing. But God turned all of that evil into good. And it's hard to see the providence of God in all of the things while they're happening. But like Joseph, after it's all over, we can look back on it and see those workings of God. See them so clearly. Does God work in the lives of His people today? Oh, yes, He does. Thank you, our Father, for working through us to do your will, using the circumstances of our lives, sometimes even the evil that people do to us, conditions that befall us, to turn them into good and unto your ultimate will. In the name of Jesus, we give you thanks for your providential care. Amen. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, that calls me from the world of care, and bids me at my Father's throne, make all my wants and wishes known. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found There's a hymn we used to sing when we were far away from home on the mission field overseas titled, The Providence of God. It's been an inspiration to lots of people and it was an inspiration to us missionaries as well. It isn't in the hymn book that we're using now, but it says, the mighty God, omniscient one, his ways we cannot trace. He reckons every good begun and crowns it with his grace. Lo, I can see him in his word. I will not doubt or fear. My steps are ordered of the Lord, His guiding hand is near. No trial can my spirit break, for God will not forsake. He will with each temptation make a way for my escape. The future beckons and I bow. My God removes the care. Behold, He goes before me now, and will my way prepare. And the chorus says, here and there and everywhere. In all the ways I've trod, I've never passed before this, beyond the sphere of the providence of God. And the music is just as beautiful as the words. All of us can expect some downs as well as some ups in our lives. Yet we have the promise of God that ultimately the Christian's going to win. Looking in retrospect on them, some of the worst tragedies of our lives have been turned into some of the greatest blessings. I'm sure you've seen that. 
That's the providence of God. The Christian sees it because he believes it. Well, we haven't said all there is to be said on this subject. It's a very big subject. Of course, we haven't exhausted all that's to be said on it. There is so much. Perhaps we'll do another program on it one of these days. I'd like to study the providence of God in the book of Esther sometime. There's so much of the gospel, the good news to be discussed. I sometimes wish I had a daily program like this so we could drink more deeply of the fountain of God's Word. I don't know how I'd manage it. Well, until that time comes, I suppose we'll have to be content with thinking with you for uh, one hour each week in these weekly studies. And we pray that you'll be uh, blessed by what we're doing and saying here. Before I go, though, I must ask you, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Have you confessed Him? Have you repented of your sins? Have you been buried with your Lord in baptism and raised with Him to the new and exciting life of the Christian? If you have, you have God's promise that in your life all things work together for good. And if not, I pray you will right soon today. If you can use an audio cassette tape or a printed transcript of today's program titled The Providence of God, you may have it absolutely free simply by writing In Search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma, 73083. And you don't have to send money. Our program and all we do for people is paid for by loving and caring Christians in churches of Christ. If you like, you may use our toll-free telephone number to make your request. That number is 1-800-321-8633. Use it. Call in your request for materials or, or for any other purpose that you may have uh, for communicating with us. And I wouldn't want to leave you uh, with this program today without inviting you to worship with the Church of Christ somewhere near you. There is one not very far from here. Would you do that? Invite someone to go along with you too. And if you need help in locating that place where they meet and worship, then let us know. And we'd be glad to help you find that congregation. We plan to be back next week. I hope you do too. And maybe you can invite some others to come along with you. Um, God bless you now. We love you.